Welcome to the Witness Underground podcast. I'm Scott Homan, the host of the podcast, as well as the director of the feature documentary, also Witness Underground. A very special episode that I did, I would consider it a kind of collaboration with a podcaster out of England. His name is Jonam Ross. He runs the Religion Rehab podcast. He said it was okay to repost this on my own show and on our YouTube. We're both really happy to support each other's projects. He runs a really interesting program that deals with hypnotherapy, and it's not one of those programs where you need him forever, like a normal therapist. The healing world, you kind of need to keep on going back to that person. You need to get another massage. You need to get another Reiki healing. He's built a tool where you can learn how to do this important method of diving deep into your inner world and fixing a problem. And if the issue comes up again, you have that tool to then do the work the second time or the third time if something keeps on coming up for you. He's removed from the equation once you've learned the tool. So he has an incredible program. He's going to introduce it. Go listen to his podcast and support it. He has a lot of great episodes, but I've grabbed his intro and then we have our conversation. Thanks for listening in. Witness Underground Podcast number 26. Welcome to this episode of the Religion Rehab Podcast. How have you been? It's good to have you here. I'm excited to be sharing today's interview with you because it's close to my heart in two regards. I'm interviewing Scott Homan, who produced the film Witness Underground. It's absolutely fascinating to watch. I highly recommend you check it out. Let me read the blurb to you. Witness Underground is a feature documentary that reveals the insular DIY artist community that emerged within the high-control Jehovah's Witness religion in Minneapolis. Music, fame, and success are typically forbidden in the religion, which instructs its members to beware of independent thinking. The artists at the heart of the music scene have their faith tested in deeply personal ways. They battle for positive mental health and push the boundaries of their religion's norms, where leaving often means being banned from interacting with your entire family and social circle for life. Although severely restricted, they create the record label Nuclear Gopher, and produce over 30 albums of earnest and personal music that span singer-songwriter, riot girl, psychedelic rock, pop, EDM, shoegaze and post-rock, carefully curated songs and live performances punctuate their stories of friendship, deep loss and personal growth. It's a great documentary, it's entertaining, it's emotionally stirring, everything that you could want, so definitely check it out. And today I'm interviewing the gentleman who brought it all about, Scott Homan. He was the director, he brought it together, and we're sharing his story of how he grew up and had quite a unique relationship to the religion, I must say, and how that all unfolded into having such a unique project. I can't speak highly enough about it. As always, if you find this helpful, if you find this enjoyable, and if you think it would be helpful to other people, please do share it. There are so many people out there who are marketers posing as gurus or coaches or therapists. And as you know, that's not the way I run things at Religion Rehab. I want things to be shared because they're valuable. I want to give you things that are truly helpful to you and that make a difference in your life and that are worthy of being shared. And it just seems like a better way to do things. So if you find this helpful, please share it. I have a goal that I'll share with you, a personal goal of mine that I've never shared with anyone, so I'll share with you today, is that I want this podcast and my hypnotherapy program to help 144,000 people. Maybe it'll go to more, but as a milestone to reach, the mischievous trickster in me really enjoys that number, and I think you will too. So enjoy this podcast, keep going and really make the most of the time you have, because your life is precious and your life is yours. Let's tune in to this conversation between myself and Scott Homan. I'm gonna give a quick shout out to some of the other shows who've had us on recently. Religion Rehab with Jonam Ross, this one. JW Thoughts with Wally Barnett. Cult Hackers with Stephen Mather. Jekta 2020, hosted by Riley. And Devout by Wendy Renee. They've all been super generous with their time and effort to help discuss and spread the word about the Witness Underground documentary being now out and available to watch. Please go check out our film. It's now available on our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Witness Underground. That's the one place you can watch it right now. It's streaming. All the money completely directly supports our work and the grant that we're putting together to fund an artist. We will be releasing that grant when the film is fully out in other locations as part of 
our marketing effort for this film. All the money that comes in from Patreon, 20% of it goes towards the grant. Please support the XW artist grant that we are running through witnessunderground.com. If you're an artist and you hear this, go apply for the grant. Right now it's $1,000. Thank you. Without further ado, enjoy this conversation I had with Jonah Ross. Awesome. Scott, thank you for joining me. Great to have you here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, me too. I uh, heard about your project and was watching the documentary and it's uh, really exciting to see what you what you have created and what you are creating. So before we dive into that, do you want to just uh, introduce yourself a little bit and share your your backgrounds, the organization you were with, how long you were in and those general experiences, just as some context for the listener. I directed a film called Witness Underground. It's a documentary that follows musicians who were raised, born and raised inside the Jehovah's Witness religion and had access to play music and sort of built a music community of four or 500 kids, like musicians and audience. And they made about 30 albums of music under a production label called Nuclear Gopher. And because of the religious culture, they weren't really allowed to pursue success or record deals. So this became super insular, but also created incredible bonds between the individuals. And that self-expression led to freedom of thought and freedom of thought led to a number of them leaving the religion. The vast majority of them did eventually leave. And I was a musician in the next neighboring state, moved to that city. And I was raised kind of around the Jehovah's Witnesses from about seven or eight years old, my parents sort of got involved with that. Like they chose this path and us kids, there's five of us were sort of raised at different levels of connectivity to this faith while also having an entire family outside of the faith in different faith groups or just not in any religion. So I had friends, normal friend experiences while also following some of the Jehovah's Witness rules, the bigger ones, I guess. Mm -hmm. and generally adhering to the culture and there's some things i really appreciate it appreciate about it such as you know having old people in my life throughout my youth um and yes i made this film because of my experience after leaving in my 20s with shunning and shunning kind of came as a surprise to me because my parents never really took the religion all that seriously and my siblings as well never really took it all that seriously So when it happened that they started taking religion seriously after I left the religion, after, you know, auxiliary pioneering or after um, going abroad to experience what the religion, how it operates internationally and delve into that part of the culture, I was so surprised that they, the, the least faithful Jehovah's Witnesses, the least adherent to the faith, would then use shunning to do this emotional abuse thing. Like, it makes sense if you do that when you're living in the house. And you're a teenager who's acting up or like not doing what the parents want to do. But I was in my late tw- mid late twenties when I was fully out, and then it was years before they started shunning. So it was like, where is this mm-hmm. coming from? You're doing this like weird abandonment control mechanism. So anyway, that informed the film in a really deep way. And having the music background, it was a way to show my my access to my background with music was a way to show. Um, and working with musicians, there's five musicians in the film. And like, we show off the music culture through their archival music and then their transition out of the religion. They made music that sort of cat, uh, dove into their exit process through art. And they have all these old short films and B rated films that they made a lot of comedy and goofy stuff that sort of showed off the fun, vibrant culture of this scene. While also, um, in the interviews, they're able to talk about what that was like to what it was like to make that. And then um, also how the community of Jehovah's Witnesses reacted to those pieces of art, because it's sort of not, it's very not normal in the whole world of Jehovah's Witnesses to be making art that goes out into the world. Mm. Um, And then of course, like their music has no religious themes because that's off off limits. You can't really talk about your love for God or praise to God because they are in control of that way of thinking and how you act. And so they they kept it really secular about relationships, about life, about being youthful. And it's, it's interesting because like this body of like secular music made by religious cult members, um, which you wouldn't necessarily get. Edge, isn't it though? Yeah. Yeah. Have you found that people who had some kind of artistic dimension to them or that, that they expressed have found the, um, readjustment process? Um, 
maybe not easier, but a little like there's there's an outlet valve for some of this mess that can go on inside of our heads when you have art or music or filmmaking or, or some kind of creative way to let that out. Have you noticed that it makes a difference or is it just uh, different versions of the same thing? A couple things come to mind when you ask that question. One is the big theme of the Witness Underground film and the Witness Underground podcast is that self-expression through how, whatever avenue is helps to heal. And I think part of that, and I'm not an expert in this space, but part of that is loving yourself. You're taking time to be present, to make a thing that you are excited about and then share it with others. Focusing on yourself in a way that I think the religion is really limiting. You're not really allowed to express yourself. They want you to repeat what they tell you to repeat and believe it. And like every single church experience, whether that's going preaching door to door, or that's being at their church sessions, which are basically indoctrination experiences, mm. the entire thing is to reinforce what they're telling you by telling others or repeating it back. So it almost seems like it's your own thought where self-expression mm. is outside of that entirely. And it's sort of embracing what's inside you, embracing your inner ability to think for yourself. Mm. And so that leads from my from what, how I understand it, and I'd love to have your perspective on this, leads to freedom of thought, which then helps you take that those steps towards self-realization. And in the case of the artist in the film, getting out and choosing to take those risks and mm. make the life that they wanted to make and landing on the outside. And then there's something that almost no film has ever done in this space that I've seen is the landing on the outside aspect of it. Like, okay, well, fast forward, what happens after all these terrible losses of innocence, of family, of community. There's, that's enough losses, yes, but you're shunning. That's a lot. <laughs> um, those things. Any one of those would be could be disrupting, derailing to someone's life, and mm. people suffer a lot from that. So, how did they? How did they land on the outside? And it's like this big, like fresh, like deep breath and like release. Like, okay, they're going to be okay, and if I'm going through that or you're going through that, I can see through their example that there is a path out, and there mm. it's satisfying and free freeing liberating yeah yeah it's comforting to know that you're not the first person to do a thing it's a bit mm -hmm. like walking across a frozen lake or something it's like if you're the first person to do it it's like ah oh, geez i'm not so sure I, I did a fire walk uh years ago different element but same 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 theory um one of the tony robbins events i was still in the religion actually and uh, so I sort of chirpily told the uh, told the elders, they're like, oh, we didn't see you last weekend. Where, where were you? I said, oh, yeah, I went to London and did a fire walk, you know, completely innocent and oblivious to the fact got taken to one side, counseled that it was consorting with demons, all this stuff. I'm like, pretty sure when the devil was thrown down with a third of the stars of heaven, they didn't say in here, Satan, take this little corner of physics for free. You know, like have this as a bonus, <laughs> but uh, they didn't like my attitude. But anyway, the, by the time I got to it, there were like eight thousand people there, and at first you're like, "Holy crap!" You know, I'm going to walk across these fiery coals, and it's kind of intimidating. But by the time you've seen five hundred people stand in front of you walk across it, it's like, "Yeah, I can probably do this. It's, it's going right. to be okay." And with things like your documentary and. I hope with this podcast as well, sharing people's stories, it it lets you know as the listener, like, okay, people have been through this, people can come out the other side of it. And there are so many different forms it can take, but the 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 core experience of surviving and recalibrating and coming out the other side of it is most certainly possible. So to do to approach that from the musical angle and, and that specific subculture is really unique and enjoyable. Thank you. Um, what you just said reminded me of one of the best things I found on the internet this year, which was I, I joined when I was doing this, making this film, I'd never like for 10 years, I'd never looked on the internet about what ex Jehovah's witnesses or former witnesses have done. I like I'd indoctrinated myself in my own way over a long period of time. And I was kind of doing like culture, cultural anthropology research to figure out like what's going on in the space. And who's talking about what, what, you know, what's going on And one post I found just recently this year was like, no judgment. What do you believe now? And there was like 250 posts and it was incredible, an incredible variety of belief 
and maybe belief strong word is like, what is your worldview now? Mm -hmm. And so there was people who are, who thought like I did when I first left, like it's clean slate, atheism, they're all the supernatural stuff isn't real. And that was a great place to start. And as I've experienced things throughout life and experienced different cultures and people and perspectives, I've added some ideas back into my life that have value and certain life practices. For example, I like find a lot of personal benefit from yoga and a lot of personal benefit from meditation. And I don't think of those necessarily as spiritual. They're just healthy. I mean, we can talk about more about what I believe now, but this mm-hmm. post was amazing because it, there's people that were practicing tarot and they find value in that, or the people that are total Wiccans and they believe in all the ancient ideas of, you know, middle Europe from the middle ages and are all in on, um, casting spells. And it was amazing. Cause like no one was judging as well. Cause there's a lot of posts and threads in that space. It was just like a joy to read every single one because people had fully like incorporated a, a completely different worldview into their life in some cases. And some were just really had clean, simple views of the world or like hum- humanists, um, understanding and respecting everyone as humans, regardless of their background and culture. Yeah. Yeah. It was such a relief to reach that point where you're like, I can actually hear someone else's belief system and not need to convince them of anything. I don't need to tell them how they're wrong and the Bible proves it. Like n- none of that. You know, even if they're, I have some good friends who are Mormons and it's still very much involved in, in the church. And I just realized, Hey, I can speak with my friend without having to play mental chess with him. I can mm-hmm. just, and, and I can actually be curious about what's, what's going on and like, well, what's your experience of that? What's keeping you in? And obviously like there's mixed opinions about that particular group, but the, j- just to be able to be open-minded and open-hearted towards other people and mm-hmm. to, to see others. I've not seen that post. I'll have to check and uh, have a read. It was in, interested. it was in some Facebook group and I'm yeah. a member of like every Facebook group yeah. of Jehovah, ex Jehovah's witnesses in the world, just because I am interested in Recently, that part of it. Yeah. It's a bit exhausting, to be honest. Like, I don't want to live in that space every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's no, a weird identity yeah. to maintain throughout life is that I used to be a part of something. It's like, yeah, even the word atheism, it's like, I don't believe in your, you know, imaginary friend. Yeah, it's like I'm, I'm a <laughs> Jehovah's Witness alumnus. I graduated. I don't do right. that anymore. <laughs> you know, yeah. I can have a high school meetup one day in 20 years time. Yeah, um, exactly. Do, do you find that the the essence of, of music and art in general, I think is quite, we could use the word spiritual or, or transcendent or something is like you're, you're getting beyond yourself when, when you're in, in that state of artistic flow, you're not thinking the thoughts you'd usually think you're not um, worrying, hopefully about what, you know, what you're being perceived as when you really go into that kind of zone, that every musician or art, artistic person can um, can relate to it's it's like you you lose yourself to a certain extent but it's that that liberating sense and um have have you noticed that that in maybe in in your own experience helped help to create some relief and that that almost like a pilot hole which then guided you in like you said earlier the the sort of freedom of thought or the ability to set some belief systems to one side for for just long enough to go well Maybe that's not the whole world. Maybe that's just a little, little map of the world there. I think when, like from my experience, when I used to play music a lot and make music, I would play one or two hours a day for years. That was my general state, something I did every day. And I lived in a like music studio. I had like, we had like a, my parents bought this extra house on the land nearby when the neighbor died. And we just, since we were teenagers, put our music instruments there and we'd go there and practice. And then eventually, like I lived there for a couple of years and my little brother did. And throughout all of our high school experience, we had all these instruments there. Anyway, I, now that I do regular meditation, the practice is generally like this. There's thoughts in my head. They're not me. They're just ideas. And I can accept or reject them or let them control me. But when you're, when I'm meditating, I recognize them and then have the awareness to realize 
that they're happening and I'm getting lost in it. Okay. Reset, focus on the breath, basic stillness meditation. But when you play music, it's like something like it's a, it, maybe it's a similar experience, but there's that voice in your head isn't there because you're so completely immersed in the experience of playing music and connecting, you know, notes together in sort of the language of music, if I can use the word language. And I think something about percussion and music is something that's much older than music, probably before our ancestors could speak and communicate um, th in anything similar to what we have now, they probably made music at communally. And I mean, I don't know, it's just a guess, right? It's a hypothesis. But it's my, my experience with playing music is that like the, the distraction of this voice in the head or whatever the anxiety that's happening or whatever my, my subconscious is preoccupied that it keeps bringing up this topic. It's completely off. It's not completely in another that's doesn't, it's not happening at all because I'm involved in something creative and I'm focused on that thing or immersed in that thing. And if there's other people involved, even more so because you're not being selfishly like self-absorbed, you're like experiencing something in a communal sense. And I think it's really freeing to take those breaks and the religion want you to have, you know, their ideas pumping through your head. Or if you're wondering about what you can do, but it might just you know, be disobeying the rules. Like, well, what would the religion want me to do? You know, that those kind of thoughts can like, or you know, how, how am I going to like get away with this thing I want to do? Or like, should I get, should I, should I kiss that person or not? Or like, how, you know, I don't know, whatever the thought is, but music, you're like in another world and it's great. Um, anyway, I, I would love to hear from experts what they think, because this is my whole project. It's like bring musicians on, help them tell their stories, but also promote their music. And then the, for the audience that's experiencing that podcast, enjoy that music, support the artist directly and help their music, the experience of that music probably will, you'll probably relate to it if you went through anything related to this, no matter what the faith group you left or whatever worldview you've changed, or even like a someone from another culture who's grown up like a, someone from an immigrant, let's say in your country, who's come to your country, they have a completely different way of seeing the world and experiencing this new place. Like I've had people that have watched the film who have no connection to religion, especially not this religion, but they totally related to some of the characters and the ideas in, in that they are from two different cultures or they're experiencing a new culture from a different perspective. And that felt like meaningful to them. Mm. Yeah, it's relevant to so much more than the tiny, well, not that tiny, actually, but the relatively small sub niche of sort of religious cult survivors. It applies to many situations in life where you're going from a big change, a huge culture shock or a, a, a change in identity or a big shift in just the chapters of life. You know, sometimes you maybe move to a different country or you know, leave a job you were at for a long time and suddenly the, the social network's changed and the uh, your identity has changed to a degree. And th there's a lot to be learned from this rehabilitation process as well. Um, have you noticed in the interview process and just your own learning curve, um, common themes amongst the different musicians who you've been involved with from the musicians they often talk about feeling really suppressed and that music was an important outlet for them but the more they played music the more they wanted to express themselves the more they wanted to do more the more they were kind of hitting as I, i've written for the film hitting the bars of the cage that they're in kind of like realizing that there's limits that this group is putting on them Whereas the average witness wouldn't necessarily recognize that, or they would think that those limits are maybe their own choice. But the musician is like, no, I'm actually trying to do this thing and I keep getting shut down. And I think like at some point that compression, like a compressing a spring, at some point they're like, I'm going to release the album. I'm going to play mm -hmm. the show at the bar. I'm going to make this happen. Or like, this is my one, this is the one thing that brings me true joy in life. You can't stop me. I have to do this. It brings me like, it brings me happiness and limiting my happiness seems like what you shouldn't be doing as mentors in my life. And they're not doing it to like help that person. They're doing it to keep them in line or control them. People have shared that kind of thing with me from many mm. different perspectives. Yeah. It definitely gets you to test thresholds that 
many people wouldn't care about. Like I remember I was in a wedding band for a time, playing playing guitar mainly eventually. And um, so, so I'd be playing various things and I was into all kinds of, you know, stuff, mainly metal and whatnot. But in the band, we played mainstream kind of stuff. And so I, I was practicing something. I can't remember what, maybe Pantera or Disturbed or one, one of these guys. And uh, some JW relative or friend, I forget who it was exactly, but I, I remember the conversation because I was like, oh, that sounds very, yeah, sounds like worldly music, sounds like satanic music. I was like, why? So, well, it sounds angry. I said, well, all this is, this is guitar strings and it's going through the amp um, and there's some distortion on. And they're like, yeah, it sounds kind of loud and metally and like, like uh, satanic music. So, like, okay, cranked the gain and the distortion down. So it's just a clean tone, sounded mm. like an acoustic guitar, basically. Played the same thing. I was like, is that satanic music? And they're like, well, no, that doesn't sound satanic at all. I'm like, right, so, so the devil is in this little distortion dial <laughs> right <laughs> we, we turn that up and it suddenly fills the music with satan is that right <laughs> and they're, they're like well i just don't think that's the kind of music jesus would listen to like, he was in ancient palestine they didn't have much selection back then let's, uh, <laughs> let's get creative you know so it, it definitely forces you outside of the bounds that like i say, if, if you're not into it if you're not into music mm -hmm. or whatever you, you just wouldn't think to care about it but it's it sort of it, it starts building up these little little pieces of evidence where it's like, well, maybe the rules aren't what they think the rules are. And okay. that in itself, I think that's the thin end, thin end of the wedge that can help a person start to wake up. Yeah. Being challenged with absurdity. And then you're like, well, your opinion is pretty similar to what the, the religion says. And I think it's ridiculous is the start or like, you know, you have a thousand, I probably had a thousand of those before I finally left the religion over like 15 years or something. Yeah. yeah. This the, idea. You're, yeah. It's like, what, what was the last straw? It's like the last straw is like almost the least important thing. It is a, it is a notable moment though. And everyone, I do like to know the last straw for people, mm. um, but I wanted to comment on your appreciation for metal and heavy music in general. I loved your, I listened to one of your, hypnotherapy trance mm. what is a half hour hour long experience yes. and there was you have beautiful soundscapes that go with it that are mm. perfect for what you're trying to accomplish you have a great voice for it but then the next one i turned on i think there was something like like a little audio blip at the beginning and i was like Oh, it sounded almost like a distortion of a guitar yeah. or something or like a voice like a little bit of a growl and I was like, and I, maybe I just heard something because it was like in an echoey room anyway. And then, then it was like beautiful soundscapes again. I was like, you know, what would be so cool is to do what, exactly what Jonam's doing, but using like metal sounds. Because for me, metal has always sort of like calmed me down. And I feel like, I feel, I don't feel anger. I don't feel what a lot of people that don't listen to it yeah. feel anger for some reason, or they experience something that they think is evil. For me, it's always, I've always been attracted to that kind of music. The intensity of it doesn't bring rage or negative emotions. It brings like, ah, like calm, like, yeah. Or it's like releasing to sing along with this stuff. Cause like you're expressing through voice as like an, just another form of an instrument, even if it's screaming, like the lyrics are really interesting sometimes or funny from metal world or punk rock or screamo. Mm. I don't know. It's like a big release for me. And it would be interesting to like, so I, I just I want this I want someone else to make this thing <laughs> meditation like for metal meditation heads. through metal yeah <laughs> I think it would be it would like get spread around in the metal community in a big way and metal fans yeah mind mindful metal yeah exactly well there's a project in there somewhere I'll, I'll see if I can find the time <laughs> I did see like a a music my friend sent me a, a music sorry a metal festival yoga session like yoga for med metal heads and there was like thousands of people all dressed in black and like outfits for concert but they were like on yoga mats doing like <sighs> positions like holding <laughs> the really i don't know how you call it the warrior pose or whatever but like doing some modification with like <laughs> horns it was so funny to see like thousands of people doing that <laughs> you know, I've, I've often found that some of the most chilled out people I know are like ex-special forces 
like monsters <laughs> in the right context and <laughs> right. total metal heads so you, you meet them totally just chill chilled out and i think there's yeah. something to the fact that if if that kind of music resonates with you it's not psyching you up or getting you into a bad state if anything it's it's creating that outlet valve where you can mm. it, it gives those emotions somewhere to go that is not destructive um, especially if you're able to play it, but even just listening to it, 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 it gives a, a little, you know, a little filing cabinet to send those emotions and then off they go and, and you're better than you were before. And right. not everyone's the same, but the, for the people it resonates with, finding your art form, whatever it is that connects with you, I think is, is really therapeutic and it's, mm -hmm. it's hard to prescribe because everyone is different, right. but just intuitively finding what feels good to you. Um, mm -hmm. That's something that we were alienated from in, in cults. Generally, it's dis dead in your body members, disown yourself, don't listen mm -hmm. to yourself, your heart's treacherous, all of this. And so just the, the that intuition of saying, hey, I like this just because I like this. It makes me feel good when I listen to it or it makes me feel good when I do it. And so I'm going to do it for only that reason. Like you said, like, that's almost the beginning of self-love and self-knowledge and, mm -hmm. and accepting yourself. On one extreme end of a metal show, you have the, the mosh pit mm. where people are at the front of the stage and they want to move their bodies to the music and the music's intense. So they're moving their bodies in an intense way and like gliding into people. And it's just like, could be a circle pit or it could be like people pushing each other. And it looks from the outside as like a very violent thing. And I've always been drawn to enter that space for the same reasons everyone else is there. And I think it started in the seventies with pogo dancing, which was like super innocent. People was like jumping up and down, bumping into each other. And then it was slam dancing where like, it's more, it's like, it's like electrons and heat, like they're moving or atoms are like their molecules are moving faster and faster and faster in a microwave. Right. But the hotter it gets, people are letting this thing out. And it's like the smiles on the people's faces in a mosh pit are like pure joy and people are getting pushed and like there are bruises for sure. But if anyone falls down, the entire thing stops in that space to pick that person up. Like it's actually like an ex a dance expression that is filled with great people just trying to have a good time. It just happens to be like bodies bumping into each other in a unique place that like kind of doesn't exist outside of a concert setting. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. Even at the extreme end of metal, it's still like a really fun, joyful place. Yeah. Yeah. You're there, there to have a good time. And then you, you're right. I've never seen real sort of destructive, harmful behaviors. You'll see that shit at, you know, pop concerts and mm -hmm. nightclubs. No problem. But uh, uh, me metal concerts, metal communities. I'm the, I'm the other guy. I'm the guy who like leans on the front railing and gets there super early and just tries to catch the guitar picks and, you know, drumsticks and whatever the hell else gets thrown off the stage. You know, <laughs> so... and get crushed into the railing by the marsh pit behind you. Yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's kind of a it's it's kind of a fun moment. I'm geeking out at the at whatever the guitarists are doing. Is I, I was that type. Maybe I'll try a mosh pit one day. But uh, if I'm feeling brave, you'll get thrown around. It's yeah, great. might enjoy <laughs> it. So, <laughs> so in terms of the. That obviously music's a huge part of it, but you, you also have other outlets as well. Like the, the videography work and the production value on the, the documentary is really high. And uh, I was watching, I was like, this, th this could be on Netflix or Amazon Prime or, or something like that. It, it wouldn't look out of place there. So that doesn't come out of nowhere. So what, where did you go from from being in the organization to ending up picking up all of these skills which are now culminating in this project i would say there wasn't a a delineated moment in time where i was like well i'm doing jehovah's witness stuff and now i'm doing music stuff and now i'm doing film stuff i started out first as a musician who just happened to be also associated with this religion my parents choice not mine and i did so on my own terms and had a lot of freedom there because my mom isn't really never really joined the religion. So in the whole side of the family was not associated. So I had a lot of leniency. So in our high school, um, we had an amazing art program in every aspect of art. So it had pottery classes. I had painting classes. I had jewelry making classes and we had a document, full documentary program 
with like all the camera gear and all the editing equipment you could possibly want in the nineties. So we made a ton of stuff, me and all my high school friends and my brother, my brother also joined it. And so I helped him on his stuff later on. We made some short docs and some serious docs and some skateboarding videos and snowboarding videos and all this fun stuff. And that class, everyone who came from that class that I'm still connected to a lot of those people, a lot of them work in the video world because we had access and experience playing with the equipment and producing stuff that we were proud of that we put on public access. Like the, the basically the YouTube of the era in the nineties was public access television. And there were, we had fans across our town that it broadcast to on channel two who would like see us be like, Oh, you made that thing. Are you the newscaster on, on that really goofy program? And so having that was amazing. And then I went to school for photography, kind of left the religion at 19. And then I kind of came back with like, well, I'm not going to tell talking to my dad. He's like encouraging me to go back to the religion. And I was like, well, I don't agree with this. I don't believe this. I don't believe this. I don't believe this. He's like, we well, should auxiliary pioneer. I was like, I just told you, I don't even believe in this religion. And you want me to go tell other people about it. He's like, that's the fastest track back in is teaching others what you do believe. And then getting like, so you want me to do this for cheap rent? I should have just gotten another job because I was saving like $120 a month to, to go 50 hours yeah. um, door to door. But I actually said yes to this, but I was like, as long as I can do all the things that I want to do and I'm not going to accept any of these limitations and that's the deal. Okay. I'll accept the religion on those terms, my terms, not mm -hmm. the way they want me to live. So I was like giving the new elders, like our whole elder body got wiped out because of who knows what. And they put all these new people and they were super strict. And I was like, okay, new guys, hey, I'm back in town and I'm going to be doing this like ox pioneering thing, apparently. Um, so do I get like certified for that? Uh, how does it work? And so like, you, you will you never be like approved. James Dean with your leather jacket and the <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> motorbike. <laughs> I had a marijuana sticker on my car and like all this stuff. And they're like, you can't be in a band. And I was like, you're upset with my band. I was actually going to quit that band to make my own band in a religion. And they're like, you also can't do that. And then I was like, here's our CD. <laughs> stop us. Like, this is happening. You can't stop people from making music. I was like, so bullet, like, uh, I wasn't taking any shit from them. Mm. And it was actually, I was really proud of that because I was sort of like, had my parents backing for that attitude. I'm like, if you have a problem with this, you can talk to my parents. Like they fully approve and they support that the music studio allows me and all my high school friends to play music and my band, my worldly band and my Jehovah's Witness band. And we can have parties with mixed groups of people. And they're like talking to my parents and my parents are like, what can we do? Like it's that or he leaves the religion probably. And so like just, I kind of just maintained that somehow. And then went to school for photography and me digital media after a couple of years when I moved to Minneapolis where the film takes place and met all those people in the, in the music scene there. Like I'd formed my own, was connected to the Wisconsin Jehovah's Witness musicians. And I moved to Minnesota next door, the next state, the next, the closest big city. It's like four hours away. And for that, that's like no big deal. And was in this part of the USA, in the middle of America, like four hour drive is like the next town. Um, so I knew people in all the towns for three hours. Then I went to that city and met all these other musicians more intimately, lived with a lot of them and played some music with them. And went to their shows and celebrated that. Went to the concert that you see in the film, that very one I was at, and um, enjoyed that a lot. So I was, you know, learning more professionally how to do visual arts. And then after finally leaving the religion, I was like, I want to explore. I want to go back to the thing I loved. I, I loved working in documentary and with cameras and editing. And I loved working on a TV station. And I absolutely loved the photography school, but I'm doing, I, in the recession of 2008, I went to school for um, engineering because there was no work. It was really, really hard to get a job. It's like 100 applicants with master's degrees and PhDs trying to get a barista job at the cafe down the street. Like you couldn't get a $10 an hour job in 2008, 2011, that time period. So I went back to school and got an engineering education and I was doing design and I still do that. I still... I really enjoy a lot of that work right now. I'm fully focused on the film and the podcast. I'm taking like a sabbatical from the engineering work, but I did that schooling and I kind of hated the culture because it's filled with like extremist um, right-wing Americans who are like reading the drudge report and like what you would call now Trump supporters, like spouting insane conspiracy theories and like non-facts as if they're real the earth is flat. I was like, how, how are the people that are working in, on the military stuff and on data center equipment and working in startups all talk and think like this and they're racist. And I was like, I don't want to deal with this 
culture. I'm, I made the wrong career choice. And I was like, had this opportunity to go to Asia and I always wanted to live abroad. And I was like, I'm going to do that, but I'm also going to buy a camera again because I'd gotten rid of all my stuff at some point. Buy a camera and lenses and some audio recording equipment. I went to Asia with just like a goal, like I'm in a new place. I'm going to like reinvent my life. And I just left the religion. So I was like, I just need to go to the other side of the planet where there's like no religion. And it was like the most, you know, I'm living in a communist country where like religion's basically banned. And I was like, this is clean. This is like mm. great place to start over. And there's so many interesting things happening all the time. I could make, I can make a film about that. I can make a film about that. I can you know, interview that person. I could do this thing. And I found a music scene there that was super international. And I just focused on like music videos and like supporting other artists and like elevating their work. Cause I like really loved a lot of the musicians there. And those became some of my closest friends. And then they started music, like their own music venue. Um, so I got super involved with that community. And then we made a documentary about the music scene in Vietnam called Hanoi Mixtape. That's at HanoiMixtape.com. <laughs> so that was like a fun kind of pilot project. And I did that while working on the beginnings of this film, Witness Underground, WitnessUnderground.com. And that became like the pilot, like the pilot film. And then like I was doing the pilot interviews for what we call the XJW coming out series. It was really long title, XJW coming out of the Jehovah's Witness religion. Mm. Super long title. Uh, so XJW coming out interview. So that's still going, but it's a bit slower because they're like to make a short doc is a lot more work than recording an audio only podcast. Mm. They take me months to do. So I'm doing them a lot slower. I have a couple on, on deck and I have a lot of interviews I haven't edited yet. I've got a couple coming out soon. One about like a researcher of the Jehovah's Witness religion who has a library, probably the largest library on earth outside of the Jehovah's Witness headquarters of every literature that every piece of literature they've ever produced since like 1872 mm. cataloged. And he has them like organized by who is the ghostwriter on each thing. Cause they never put their author name. Like this guy was like a savant for this thing. And so that's coming out soon. Wow. That's going to be cool. What was the biting point for you? So there, there was the, the sort of pilot project in Hanoi or the, the Hanoi mixtape. What do you call it? Hanoi mixtape. Hanoi mixtape. Dot com. And uh, th so there was that one. And then that's evolved and the impetus kind of moved you forward into doing these interviews and the the uh, the underground project. What, what was the point or points where you were like, yeah, I'm going to double down on this? Because in, in any project, there's like the testing the waters phase where I'm like, yeah, maybe I will. Maybe it'll go somewhere, maybe it won't. And then there's a point where you're like, yeah, actually, this is, I'm, I'm going to run with this and see where it goes. What was that for you? Annoying mixtape project was me kind of celebrating all the music video and music musicians and genres of music that existed within that community of people, the Hanoi music scene. And it was sort of a more of a celebration of the scene and those friends my form of honing my skills like all through that time after leaving the religion up to that point where i was in hanoi doing this stuff with film i had this idea in the background of my mind that like shunning is evil and i'm suffering from the emotional abuse of that how do you tell that story and then i was traveling visiting family in germany and my brother's ex-wife had left the religion so we were hanging out and she's like hey i want to introduce you to another person who also left the religion who i met randomly and him and I, uh, I was like, you know what, let's, you know, just fuck it. I have a small camera kit here. Let's just do a, my first interview on the topic. Let's just see what happens because I don't know what's going to happen. And that was a really interesting interview. I learned, I already, you know, know how to interview people, but I'd never interviewed people on this deep, heavy topic. And then after that, I found someone came to me in Hanoi and was like, hey, there's this Vietnamese woman who joined the religion in high school, but then she left. And it was like a coming home to the family story because her family hated that she was in a cult and like recognized it for what it was. And then eventually helped her unwind that. And she was getting in trouble by the religion for breaking some rules. And they gained this whole thing. Um, so her story is super interesting. And I was like, okay, this is fun. And I was like, I should work with someone I know really well, because I know so many people who also left the religion. So I interviewed a really, really good friend of mine from Minneapolis who was living on the West coast. We, I was like, Ross, let's go on a road trip for two weeks and like record what we can and like talk through stuff. So I made like 20 little audio snippets of like just crazy conversations that him and I are able to have. And that was really fun to dive in with someone I really trust and knew well. And I could get really personal and be involved in the talking rather than just be like a passive, like behind the camera interviewer. 
And eventually more and more, I started like including myself in it because that made the other person feel comfortable. And eventually I developed this style of interviews that I, I don't know, it's, it's evolving all the time, but now I'm doing the podcast, which is very much inclusive and doing what you and I are doing. It's been, it's been a big process and it's been really useful to me as well to like dive in deep to these stories because I relate so well to the individual I'm interviewing. And for them, no one's ever asked about this thing. It's like a secret topic they can't talk about because no one will ever get it. And to get these stories to understand what really was going on for them emotionally and physically and what they had to do to change their lives. Like no one has the patience to listen to that four hour story ever. Like I've not found anyone who has the patience for that. No one. So to give people that is like a gift. Mm. Like here's the space to tell your story. And then I can like cut it up into like a more concise thing that the public might want to hear. But like, I like to put out the raws too. So that people, if they want to know more. There's like, all right, go here. It's a two hour interview, but here's a 30 minute cut of like the most like powerful moments or something. Mm. And I think that's a, w- a way to like heal personally. If you have any kind of similar experience, no matter what your background is that like other people have these similar kinds of things, or if you did come from a cult or this particular one that you'll like, you have, these people have a voice and your story is important and you can relate to this, like live, you can, I don't know. There's, I'm sure there's all kinds of different responses and experiences that are relatable, but Mm. through all of that, one thing you said before was interesting was that people can have these kinds of experiences, no matter what their background is. And I set out to make a film very, very specifically about leaving this faith and the shunning that happens. And then what it's like after landing. And in the end, the people that are relating to it are from all walks of life. Mm. And it's not just for this community. You know, it's like it has a much bigger, wider appeal. That in itself is really valuable to realize because we can often bring this idea of being in the world and not of the world. You can bring that with you long after you've binned off the, that means got rid of in the UK parlance, got rid of the, um, you know, the, the doctrinal beliefs that some of the hangers on can be things like that. Like I'm in the world, but no one really gets me. I'm kind of separate. I don't relate to people and, and they can't understand me or they can't relate to these deep, dark things about me that I can never open up to anyone about. And then realizing through, through a medium like this or, or seeing someone else very much relating to these kinds of stories, even though the context is kind of different, but the actual structure of it and the experience is, um, is humanizing and it it makes you realize that yeah this is was a messed up situation but it's also a very human situation and i'm not an alien and i don't have two heads and i'm I'm not a permanent outcast because of this it's it's just another part of what can be experienced when you are a human um that realization is really healing for people when they can really get that sense of not being completely weird and realizing that it's it's an unpleasant but normal part of humanity um not to say we shouldn't try and correct it but you you know what i mean there's there's that do, yeah um de- demystification of it there's something i think i appreciate in a lot of other films and i realized that when i we went and took this film on the film festival run is the films that i loved from the film festivals and you get a lot of really interesting new perspectives in film festivals that you might, might not see on a big streaming platform. And it's a lot of them I loved were about humanizing the characters, humanizing an experience. There was one film that stuck out to me, Hen- Henry Arroyo, I think his name is from Brooklyn. He made a short film about um, a black man. You, you see him wake up or he's like in, in his house and he wants to make tea, but he doesn't have tea and he's sick. And then he goes to buy tea and like coming back with like a grocery bag with a box of tea in it. He gets harassed by some like white security guard. This is like the last thing I need right now. I'm just have a cold, like stop being you know, a fucking dick. I have to deal with racism to buy a bag of tea. And I, I felt like that hit so hard for like, you know, it's a four minute film. And, and I realized that what I tried to do maybe without even realizing it is to humanize Jehovah's witnesses and then humanize ex-Jehovah's Witnesses and 
because no matter what, while I was in the associated with the religion, people thought something strange about me or told things to others about me, like framing, oh, he's in some weird cult or he can't do the birthday party or he can't come to this thing because, you know, fill in the blank. And then when I left the religion, I'd tell people anything about my story and they'd say, oh, yeah, like Scott was in a cult. And it's like, no matter what that person, my friend, they've never listened to my story. They don't have any idea really what my story is. They've heard something and they put it in their categorized little box where like he's different. I'm going to tell my friends how different he is because that's like the most interesting thing about him is he's so different than the rest of us. And that otherizing has never ended and it drives me crazy. And it was one of the motivations. Like I need to make something because no one will ever understand my experience or anyone else who went through something similar because they do this thing that it's like so infuriating when they do it. And it's like uncomfortable because if you really, if you reveal, it's like coming out to someone, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I'm not going to speak for the LGBT community, but it's some, there's some similar features to coming out with this information that someone will then use that now salacious, like noteworthy information to then tell other friends because now they have the inside scoop on this person's like weirdness. And like, mm. yeah, we, we all came from some bizarre place. Like, can you like understanding it would be a lot healthier, please, than making fun of it or like pushing me outside of your in group because of it. Mm. And so I felt like I want to make a film that I could say, if you actually want to know, watch this and then we can talk after your hour and a half education that I've you know provided to you through this film <laughs> yeah I, it makes so much sense to do them and I, I do a, a, a similar principle for different reasons with hypnotherapy clients because what you notice is that before uh, one-on-one cl- client work you, you have the same conversation with everyone which which is generally the the pre-talk right that here's what to expect here's what to do here's how to get the most from it it's the same conversation and, and after you've had that you know, 50, 100 times, it's like, I, I don't need to say this again. So just put it into a, a recorded sequence of, uh, you know, documents or conversations and, and just share that so that then the people come to you and they're primed and ready. Um, but it, it does make sense to do what you've done. I mean, one angle to take with strangers is something I'll play with is, is to kind of feature the cult thing as, but as frame it as an advantage. Where I'm like, yeah, I had an immersive apprenticeship in mind control techniques from birth, and and <laughs> kind of play play that angle, which which can be pretty fun to to have as a frame. But in terms of long long standing, um, healthy lasting relationships, whether that's professional or or uh, romantic and personal friendships, um, having this level of understanding and vulnerability is a like that's a whole new skill to learn. Um, so, so the fact that you're putting this or have have put this thing together that actually helps people to humanize themselves and to connect from that human level to other people is is uh, r- really valuable. I, I hope people see the value in it as as much as I can see it being really helpful. I like your idea of reframing it. I often get this response that you tell them anything. They have this idea of what a cult is or a religious experience or a high control experience might be. And they assume that you had the most extreme experience because they have no idea. Or they don't even realize that they also have had a similar experience, but in a different way of framing it. Like my friend who came, moved to North America from Taiwan, wonderful person, love her. But she also has like cultural norms that are like programming from a culture and to call it programming might sound negative, but like norms. And when a situation comes up, the choice, it might not be a choice to make, it might be an automatic response. And I think you did a great job in your like introduction information that you put together for your program of you have a input and then you have a response. And at some point you could change that with awareness to have input and you can make a choice to respond this way or that way or not at all. And you, you have a better way of putting it together, but most people in every walk of life have been programmed through the news cycle, through their culture, through their um, family upbringing, and consider their ways of responding to things as normal, 
and don't understand it as a loop or a program that auto responds for them from their subconscious kind of indoctrination. And this happens for everyone in every part of your life. You might be bringing in new ones or replacing them, you know, or you might have old ones still from your childhood or something. Um, but yeah, reframing, reframing it as I have experienced the attempt at mind control and successfully resisted. In a lot of cases, in my youth, I was experiencing the mind control tactics and recognizing them for what they were and resisting them for the most part. Some of them got through, most of them didn't. And that was how I maintained doing all the things I wanted to do with my life, even as a youth, that most people considered like deeply off limits because they, they obeyed. And I was like, well, this doesn't even make any sense. I'm not going to do that. Like, I don't care what you think. But I also had support from my family to do those things. But it's interesting to think about the tapes. And I even have experienced it recently where friends have been calling me out for using negative language, for example. Like one recent example was like someone was trying to figure out how to access an app on their TV. And I was like, you're all alone over there. And my friend was like, why did you just say that? And I was jokingly saying, like, I'm not going to help you. <laughs> but she's like, yeah, but you said I'm, you're all alone out there. Like, that's a limiting belief or a belief that you might hold within. Your subconscious just shouted this out. Like, mm. the words that you say are revealing to the programming that you've accepted or the beliefs that you have about your life. Mm. Maybe next time you want to make a funny statement, recognize it for what it is before you announce it and then say, say something positive that you want to replace that negative belief with like, I wish I could help you or I will help you. Or like, I don't know, you could fill, fill in the blank. Like it's such a silly, simple example, but I was so happy that this person said something because it got me thinking about a lot of things I say. Mm. Like, why do I say them? Because I think I'm really, really funny, but I'm actually just like auto responding to things from my subconscious. Mm. Yeah, out of the thousands and thousands of things we could say, or the words we could choose for things, mm. what makes us choose the ones that actually come out? And yeah, I mean, gallows humor has its place, I think. And I'm biased because I'm British. And for us, <laughs> verbal cruelty is just a national sport. But, um, <laughs> but the, um, the, the becoming aware of these, these things that just slip out. Like if we say things like, oh, I'm, I'm not the kind of person who does X, Y, Z, or I can't do that. that. That's inaccurate, right? I don't know how to do that. That's, a, that's an accurate thing to say. But to say I can't do that is, is a prediction into the future that rules out the idea that you can actually learn and do something new. And, and all, all these things, that these um, packages of meaning are, are layered in there in the words we choose. So, and, and by the sounds of it, you're also keeping company amongst people who are aware enough to, to, to pay attention to that kind of thing themselves, which I imagine is a help yeah. too. It's great. I love it. Another great conversation on that topic that came out right on the heels of that was our mind sees the world through images. So saying something like, think of an elephant your mind pictures an elephant immediately. If you say, don't think of an elephant, you still picture an elephant because the subconscious doesn't work in negatives. Like the negative is an invention in the modern language that we've created. And I love, I love thinking about that because instead of saying, don't forget, a useful thing to say would be remember and put a positive spin on the language you're trying to infuse in others or communicate to others and yourself. Cause you're, even though you're saying it, other people, you're still listening to that same language. Maybe probably even more profoundly because you're uttering it. You've like chosen of all the thousand things you're going to mm -hmm. say this thing. Um, like negative framings don't communicate well. Yeah. But, well, that's where the, the word abracadabra which you hear in all the magical shows and well, not so much now, but kind of hokey old magical yeah. stuff, abracadabra. It's, I won't try and say it in the original sort of Hebrew or Arama Aramaic, but it translates to I create as I speak, or as I speak, so I create. 
and this this idea that your words have power as as a hypnotist obviously that's top of mind for me but the the scary thing is that we're all hypnotizing ourselves day after day after day you're by by the words you say that they're affirmations and maybe not intentional ones like say saying i can't do this or everyone everyone always xyz you know that those are the things that long after we've disproven you know, 144,000 or Great Tribulation or whatever. It's the the little hangers on of how we um, of how we keep programming ourselves to stay in these little cages. And so, anything that can help us to get out of those cages and see them from a different perspective um, is really valuable. Which is 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 what I'm trying to do. It's what you're doing as well with through the artistic medium and through the the process of interviews and music and the the podcast as well so it's it's exciting to see different approaches that are tackling similar issues um and and may, maybe share thoughts on that if you have them but a question i had for you was in that process of going from from the beginning to being in the thick of all of this now these exciting projects what lessons or realization moments have caught you by surprise the most? Personally, mm. one thing that shocked me was I needed to take the film on the film festival run. Well, I planned that and, and did everything I could to learn how to do that process. It's very complicated and a big learning curve. And I had to do public speaking after each film screening in front of an audience on the topic of Jehovah's Witnesses and my personal family. And that caused panic attack, like at least like an anxiety attack. I'm not sure what the delineation is between those two, but I experienced something completely derailing of my life. Like I had to like leave the building and then picked up chain, not chain smoking, but that day I did, <laughs> I bummed a cigarette and I, I had smoked when I was like 30 for a couple of years, like a cigarette a day. And I just like hit, the, got a pack and just like, couldn't stop. Like it was like, and it wasn't helping. <laughs> it was like, what is this thing I'm experiencing and why? Like I have seen my own movie a thousand times. I've seen every raw interview. Like I've, I was there for the interviews. I also lived this experience a decade ago. What's happening with my body right now, because I can't like, I can barely breathe. And the anxiety from public speaking to an audience about Jehovah's Witness stuff is like the last time I hated giving like Jehovah's Witness talks with the theocratic ministry school. I hated it. I was so, I was talking about a topic I didn't agree with, didn't believe, and I felt judged. And then they judge you publicly in front of the audience. And it was like a terrible process for me. Like it was not helpful made me hate it so much. And I think standing there in front of an audience, it was just like all those, like that was like a trigger moment. But even before that, I had anxiety about doing that. And I had gotten like emotional on stage because people are like, they're not like, oh, wow, like this is such a great film. How did you make it? Or like, why did you want to make it? They're like, every some someone in the audience had to ask like, tell me like what your relationship is with your mom right now. like you serious? Like, I don't want to go there. And I mean, they're, they're asking out of like true curiosity for like my personal situation. And I'm like, I made a film about five other people to keep distance from this. <laughs> you can ask them about their relationship with their mom, <laughs> but I was the only one there. Anyway, like I found those really challenging. And then I realized that I needed to probably work on some of what's going on. And I got therapy. Like I hired a therapist from um, recovering from religion.org has this project called the secular therapy project. And they're super highly vetted therapists because there's like a whole, there's a lot of therapists that are not vetted by some oh, organization. Jesus -y. Like, yeah. so, so many people come to me, they're like, oh, I don't want another therapist who tells me to go and pray about my problems. Like, <laughs> exactly. They do that? That's un un unfathomable. And yet so many do, especially in certain areas of the States. They will, there's whole websites of like Christian therapists who use the Bible or like, it's, I mean, it's no different than going to the Jehovah's Witness elders and asking them for help. They're like, just like Cindy in my film says, their advice is, well, pray more or maybe read the Bible. And it's like, 
yeah, what part, like do something to help. If you're going to use the Bible, like do it for me. Or, or I don't know, it doesn't really get to the point or they're like, Oh, just think about the new system. Think about their paradise that were that God promised to all of us that we're all still waiting for, for 130 years. Like that's not a solution to think about this other imaginary world that you want to solve all of your problems. Like I want to solve my problem. I'm coming to you with problems. Help me solve the problem right now. And they don't, they're not equipped for that. They're not trained for that. And their advice sucks. It's useless. And then the same thing comes, I imagine maybe they have some skills, but like referring back to this holy book is an appeal to authority, which is a logical fallacy from the start. Like their own professional title is a logical fallacy. A Christian therapist. I don't get it. <laughs> I would never use them. <laughs> maybe for Christians, but Jesus, you know, if you're part of <laughs> blasphemy. You know, for, for a, a someone recovering from religious trauma does not need to be told to invite Jesus into their hearts. Right. <laughs> not after what happened last time, you know? Yeah, exactly. So so that was great. And I, I'm really grateful that I went to this therapist. Because the first like five sessions were like deep dive into personal family stuff and issues with shunning and the uh, feeling of abandonment. And like we at one point after like the, the first, it was like five weeks, I was like, you know, like all that stuff's so old and I'm really glad I got emotional about that. And we like worked through some of that, but I feel really good now. And that's crazy. Cause it was like five, five hours of time to feel progress. I was like, you know what I really want? It's like work on like healthy relationship dynamics with a significant other. And that was like more present, more useful. And obviously like that situation, those situations that are present with this other person were far more useful because I'm sure my past trauma stuff is influencing this. So like working on something present was like where we moved to next. And um, I felt like it was amazing to like go through some heavy stuff right at the beginning and just sort of feel good pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. I don't, I would, I think the more useful thing would be to find like a, a retreat center where you're like, I'm going, my purpose every single day here is to work on old past stuff and get care. Mm -hmm. and like get understanding and like solve the problem like work it all out at once because what i found with therapy on a weekly basis one hour a week was like we'd get really deep and involved and then i'd have all these like old emotions and like feel totally dysregulated about some really old stuff mm -hmm. and then they're like okay that's end of the call you know give me 200 bucks next monday and then we'll we'll restart and it's like yeah. i have a work meeting in two minutes like yeah. And I'm totally in the wrong frame of mind to be a professional. And then it was like no aftercare or no like no like soft landing at the end. They're like, all right, how do you feel now? You said you had you were like cold and zero and emotions at the beginning and now, like, yeah, like eight and it fucking sucks. Like, what am I yeah. supposed to do with that? It'd be nice to be like in a place where whoever's being paid, whoever I'm paying to like solve or help me deal with an old thing would stay there until it like got through it all and then landed and then, okay, we'll do a new problem tomorrow or like later today and like spend a month or two there and then leave that place feeling really, really good for the rest of my life rather than have the for-profit therapy industry, like take my profits every week and then re-trigger some old shit and then like offer nothing at the end until next week. Yeah. where I'm like, I've closed back up again. So I'm a little bit like, I do enjoy it. I think it is helpful and useful, but also it's not exactly a solution. It sort of like perpetuates the problem to maximize profits in a sense. I think they're good and well-meaning people, but their business is on a schedule. It'd be awesome to have even just like a three hour session if it was affordable. Yeah. Finish it, the process. The, there are so many oh my god so many people end up <laughs> speaking to me who have the same experience where it's like i've gone to therapy and it's made things worse or i've been in therapy for like six months and like we're only just starting to make progress and now i'm i'm out of the budget you know mm -hmm. and and it's like if if you're not seeing results within the first five sessions at least like at, at most i should say like s scrap them off you know that, that, mm -hmm. that's but because so much of this is it's not that complicated when you know what to do, which if you're a therapist, you should. And um, this idea of, of people coming in for years and spending tens of thousands of dollars 
uh, for you not to influence them. That's that, that's one of the approaches of therapy. It's not mine. And, and the hypnotherapy is very much like, you know, you come in because you want a result. Um, the most common approach is, uh, I would liken it to Uber or a taxi, where it's like you, 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 sh you show up and say, here's where I want to go. And then the, the person takes you there. The way I'd try to do it, and, and your retreat idea is is perfect for this, is that it's more like learning how to drive. It's like, hey, here's how your mind's working. Here's all the crap that was put into it. And let's, we can expose that and explore that and just make sense of it. But most importantly, here are the mechanisms you can use to deprogram yourself or to reprogram yourself in a way that's actually useful to you. you know, here's how mm -hmm. you can learn new skills. Here's how you can delete old patterns. Like that's, that's actual helpful learning. And, and you're right, just doing it in this one-off kind of bit bizarre structure that most, um, most clinics follow, it's not, mm -hmm. uh, it's not optimal. Uh, and there's definitely yeah. room for something better in the market. Yeah. One of the things I keep on, because I, I actually now use a different therapist that's way more affordable, but it's sort of empty because they're like, well, tell me how things are going with you. I'm like, okay, how do you feel about it this way? And then you do that like about two or four topics and they're like, okay, hey, that's about the end of our session. I'm like, yeah, I already know all of this. You have offered me nothing at the end of the session or throughout, like you're just asking me questions that I already have experienced. And I already know the answer to all of those questions because I am living it. Mm -hmm. Give me tools, give me homework, give me something. And I'm just sort of like, even though it's more affordable, I'm still sort of like at the end, I'm like, why did I just burn an hour telling this guy about what's going on? Like it, it does feel good to vent about it, I guess, but it's not mm -hmm. exactly, I could do that to my friend <laughs> over a beer or just like not do it because I already experienced it. But yeah, anyway. yeah f finding, finding the thing that works for you mm -hmm. is, and, and pe people are different, you know, but e even if it's just starting with the, you know, artistic expression, building up a support network around you, learning mm -hmm. uh, relationship skills and you know, whatever therapeutic intervention is appropriate as well. It's, um, it's, it's something that's our responsibility to find. And, and you, you reach that point where you, at first you start out feeling kind of lost and like, well, where the hell do I go from here? You know, how do I find out where to go from here? And, uh, and then once we realize we are probably on our own, like people people aren't there's no search parties most likely coming to coming to search for us and offer a bunch of bunch of help so you kind of have to right. find your own way and then turns yeah. out there are a few kind of search parties or sort of beacons like yourself and like my project and others where it's like look here's here's some help and it's it's not about anyone telling you where to go or who to be or, or whatever it's more just like here, here are some examples of what can be helpful to you and that yeah. finding that sense of community, even if you never get involved in the Facebook groups, mm -hmm. which can be rat's nests, frankly, a lot of the time. Honestly, yeah. It's like, very dramatic. Don't get stuck there. Go there, dig deep, learn all the things that you need to like distance yourself from this organization, but don't, don't stay there. Like get out of that space. Even I find that like I'm 15 years out of the religion and I've just started poking around in those spaces. And it's like, oh man, these people are just stuck there mm -hmm. and they don't know what to do. But on the topic of, of finding something that works, I'm super curious about working with you. And I've, you gave me a couple samples of your sessions you've highly curated. And there, have you ever listened to Sam Harris on the waking up app, like mm -hmm. meditation app? Yeah. Sam Harris is great. I thought he did, he does a great job with his meditation sessions and he's an atheist. So like he leaves all of the spirituality aspects of wellness in Buddhism and this way of understanding the mind out. And he's, he's like got a neuroscience background and he's just like, all right, we're going to understand what's happening in your mind. That's not a religious task. It's not a spiritual activity. It's just understand what your experience is and like, let's, observe it. And I've learned 
a lot from reading his books over the years. Even when I was a witness, I read his leaving or at the end of faith, because at the time I really wanted there to be the end of all faith. And it's sort of a Jehovah's Witness idea, but I was like, yeah, we should get rid of all of them. And then eventually I was like, also this one, this one also sucks. <laughs> but his, his work's been really influential to me. And this app is great. And I feel like you have curated and have, like, I would say like they're equal, but you've got better soundscapes than Sam, but I, <laughs> killing it. <Very> much. <laughs> but I, um, I did the first trance session and it like, I learned something just similar in a lot of their similarities to what I learned from my high school, like literature teacher. Um, she had us all lay on the floor and sort of like br do breathing exercises and slow down the heart, like deep exhales, try to mentally slow down the heart and then like relax the muscles from the top of your body one at a time, intermittent with like slowing down the heart, intermittent with like focusing on the breathing. And then just like, by the time you get, I've never gotten to my toes and I've fallen asleep. Um, but you have this, I, and I listened to a couple other sessions and, and I think there's a lot of power in the methods you're teaching to like re-experience an old thing and then process it in a way and observe it in a way that's really useful. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited to like dive deeper in and properly like give the program a chance. So if any, you know, if anyone's listening to this, he's Jones created something really special and it's, it, I'm, it's like build, giving you tools. It's not just listen, talk therapy or they listen to you and then they charge you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And yeah. that's the whole intention, you know, it's to, to, to em empower and give people skills that they can take with them. I don't need a, an army of stalkers who are dependent on me. You know, it's, it's, I, I would much rather give people skills where I'm making myself ultimately obsolete. And mm. um, I've, I've found that the combination of hypnotherapy with other things like NLP and these just, just various change work disciplines, um, you, you can get tremendous results really, really quickly. Not that the emphasis is speed. And, mm -hmm. and some people, you know, you'll see these kind of one session wonder coaches online and they're like, oh yeah, I'll turn your life around in seven minutes flat. And I'm like, mm -hmm. probably not, not for the better. Anyway, you can ruin people's lives in 30 seconds, you know, but, but uh, making it better, <laughs> it, it tends to, if you're going to make lasting change uh, that really carries forward, you need to be thorough. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and we, we call it generative change, where you're actually not just remedying things from the past, but setting things up so that you're equipped to go forward and deal with the curveballs that life is going to throw you. Mm -hmm. So when we're, we're not only no longer triggered by past things from the past that are kind of bubbling up, but you're, you're in a state of mind where you can adapt and pivot and, and uh, learn new things and develop your own approach. And that's the, the, the self authorship and self expression side of it all is, is really valuable. And so the, I, I view it as kind of giving people the raw materials and the tools and saying, look, here's, here's how you can use your mind and mm. how you can gain more power in it. And then from there, you can, you, you can wield this influence over yourself. Um, you can wield it over the rest of the world as well. If you really want to, I'd advise you, you do it ethically because you felt how much it sucks to be on the receiving end of unethical influence, right. but, um, w which is a really important lesson too. Um, mm -hmm. but, but first and foremost, you, you can reclaim this territory of, of your mind and your emotions, and you can actually make it yours rather than have it be colonized and occupied by unwanted forces and groups you know you, mm -hmm. you actually have that chance to be a freedom fighter inside your own head and to to institute your own order of things as you as you wish and i find that really exciting you know and, and mm -hmm. anything that that helps people wake up to that potential whether it's in the format of their, their artistic expression or their business expression or how they approach sex and relationships or you name it, you know, how we approach our civic duties as members of society. It's, um, it takes us out of the autopilot and, uh, and gets you into that mode of 
singing your soul's song to quote a mm. rabbi who i bizarrely quite enjoy <laughs> listening to on youtube <laughs> it's good secular information yeah. but it's, it's true i like the concept or the framing of recognize the occupiers of your mind rid them from your sanctuary and or replace them with your own ideas or ideas that you actually value and appreciate you've chosen that's a cool way to say it because everyone has occupiers and if they respond with anger or frustration i mean it could be that it's your own idea and your own anger and frustration but it could be coming from a place of opposition to someone else's ideas mm. there's so much to learn and to explore and i'm sure we actually will continue talking as this is an, yeah. an ongoing conversation uh, kind of batting things back and forth and uh outside outside of this call you know there's there's a lot to explore and to create mm -hmm. um i'm really excited to 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 see and to experience how your project unfolds and the, the things that can be you know re really inspired within people as we share things from the music to to the stories and and how that can really create this um amplitude where um th there are just victories all around you know but in in closing or as a kind of parting thought mm -hmm. what kind of advice might you give to someone who maybe is listening to this and they're they're fresh out they're fresh mm -hmm. out and they're at the point where they perhaps don't have much of social support uh, maybe they're in a bad way financially maybe they're in a bad way uh, emotionally don't have much in terms of mental um you know like confidants and people who they can turn to what uh, what advice or insights would you share for someone in that position who could find it really helpful one piece of advice i guess i'll give a string of them but in that situation you've lost your community you don't have a lot of finances I had a limiting belief when I was in that situation, even when I was just in the religion, but had no money. I wanted to do a lot of things in my life. I didn't think I could just pick up and move somewhere else. The reality is you no, know, every single place in the world, there are jobs you can get that can pay your rent and your basic life costs and removing yourself from being surrounded by people and places that remind you of the trauma of being shunned or the people that would trigger you can be this huge benefit go to a new place and it's a bit of escapism so it's like beware of that like be comfortable with that decision but you can go to a new place with nothing and build a life pretty quickly in a place without the negative influences of your past and that community that is doing emotional abuse to you and can be re-triggering you where you might not want to go to places out of fear that you'll run into people um, start fresh somewhere, even if it's just the next town over or like a place you've always wanted to live. It sounds dramatic, but it's a lot easier to do than you might think. I didn't think I could do that. And oh, this is the thing I've, I've told so many people that it's, it's a lot easier to pack up, sell your stuff and move. It's the cost of driving across the country or to another flying to another country swiping a credit card to buy a plane ticket with 30 days to pay it um flights aren't that expensive to go to the next place the hardest thing is unplanning your life where you are the hardest thing is like canceling those subscriptions getting rid of your lease on your apartment um unwinding this the social stuff deciding to quit a lot of things to start again somewhere it all sounds incredibly daunting but actually going there is super easy but that sounds very dramatic and I don't know the advice that someone in a desperate situation wants to hear. I would say unindoctrinate yourself, explore all of the information. And this is more like logical side because there's an emotional side to unwind logical side to read everything you can that you've ever limited yourself access to because the religion doesn't want you to research certain things and make you feel guilty for doing so. Go educate yourself as deeply as you can on every topic that interests you and follow your curiosities. But on the emotional side, seek professional help because there's some really big emotional traumatic obstacles that a professional can recognize. Like you, you're not alone. 
millions of people have gone through something similar and there's professionals who are there ready and prepared to help you with that thing. Brilliant. Thank you for all of the work that you put into this on, on, on a purely technical level. Um, it's daunting to say the least, you know, I've, I've seen not your stockpile, but the things that video editors go through, geez, it's like this, this pile of hours and hours of sweat and focus and probably headaches and stuff. So, you know, all of that goes behind the scenes. So, mm -hmm. you know, thank you for that. And, um, and also for lot. taking the time <laughs> to, to, uh, to, to speak today. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure. I will, really I will the share access. the, yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed the conversation. It could, could keep going, but um, we don't want to go like full Joe Rogan or Jocko and have like a four hour, <laughs> four hour thing. But uh, I will be sharing your uh, various links in the, um, in the description, but just if someone wants to look at the websites right now, what are so, the best places to find you? Almost everything that you want to know about the, the film related to leaving the Jehovah's Witnesses is called Witness Underground and witnessunderground.com is the website. And there's links there to where you can stream it. And right now there's one place you can stream it and that is patreon.com forward slash witness underground. And every single page on the website has a link to that. And that's the only place to stream it in the world right now. We're working on opening up many, many other options in many different countries and territories and expanding that to different languages as well. So there's subs in English, there'll be subs in Spanish, probably Portuguese, German, French, and then whatever else. But that's windowsunderground.com is the main place for everything. And you can find everything you want there. And there's the music from the musicians is there. A lot of people ask, how do I listen to their music? It was so powerful. How do I reach out to these musicians? I like want to give them a hug virtually. And like you can reach out to them through the website. Wonderful. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, John. Thanks so much, Scott. Speak again. Yeah. Okay, take care. See you. Cheers. Check out witnessunderground.com for way more videos and information like this if you like this episode. And please subscribe and follow on the different platforms that we're on, especially YouTube. It's important to subscribe there. It's been awesome to see that number growing in the last few months really fast. And I really appreciate everybody paying so much attention to the project. It's been really rewarding. And the one way you can watch Witness Underground right now is on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Witness Underground. There will be more other avenues coming soon, but that is the one way to directly support the project, directly support the artist grant. 20% of all the money that comes into the Patreon goes to an artist grant that the people in the movie and myself and a couple of others will help decide who gets the money and then we'll follow that artist as they go create their art project and then have them on again when they've created the thing that they wanted to do. And we're really excited because a bunch of people have signed up and if you are interested in that, go ahead and go to the website. There's a grant link at the top and you can also apply for that money. And we're, we're already raising money for round two. When the film is more publicly available is when we will give out the first grant and then as more people join and the money grows, so we'll do another one and another one. And I'm really excited about that. It's like a really fun part of the activism to kind of give back, not just extract money for a piece of art or activism, but also like create some new art and have that affect people and people can enjoy. Not only the artists can enjoy that moment, but also like the people get to experience that art and I'm really stoked to see how that all plays out. So thank you for supporting the project. We've had a huge flush of people coming in and I've been loving getting on other people's podcasts and exposing people to this film who may not have heard of it before. Religion Rehab with Jonam Ross, this one. Cult Hackers with Stephen Mather. JW Thoughts with Wally Barnett. Jack to 2020, hosted by Riley and Devout by Wendy Renee. They've all been super generous with their time and effort to help discuss and spread the word about the Witness Underground documentary being now out and available to watch. Please go check out our film. It's now available on our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Witness Underground. 